Okay, so this is the part two of the video in which I will answer your questions. So let's start the video. So Parveen Pathania says that how much deep mathematics a theoretical physicist needs? This is the biggest question always in my mind. So I would say that for most of the things that you want, uh, you know, in your undergraduate level in physics, Arfkin, Weber and Harris is more than good enough, right? Because it has topics that will be enough for you for the undergraduate level physics. But if you want to go beyond that, then it depends on what you want to work on. For example, if you want to work on compactifications of string theory, uh, you need to know about differential geometry, you need to know about algebraic geometry, and you need to know about algebraic topology. If you want to work on F-theory, for example, uh, which is you know a part of string theory to some extent, uh, you also need algebraic geometry. And for example, if you want to work on an area called non-invertible symmetries, then you need to know a little bit about category theory. So it depends on what you want to work on. One thing that I will say is that don't go overboard with mathematics. It's very easy to get sucked in the rabbit hole of learning more and more mathematics. This can be satisfying, but the thing is that this takes a lot of time from your physics research. So you don't need to be very, very rigorous with your maths when you're doing physics. A little bit of mathematics will be enough for doing a lot of physics. So that's one of the advice that I will give you from my experience. So Sorin Chaudhary says that the energy is not Lorentz invariant quantity while the four momentum is a Lorentz invariant quantity. The four momentum contains in it both energy and momentum. I want to know how do we then take conservation of energy and conservation of momentum while solving regular classical mechanics problems. Did we conserve energy in a fixed frame? Yeah, you're right. So when we talk about the conservation of energy and the conservation of momentum, we talk about the conservation in a fixed frame. Because if you change your frame, then the energy and momentum will change as you pointed out. Something that will not change when you change frames is the rest mass, right? Because it's a Lorentz, uh, Lorentz scalar or a Lorentz invariant. So you are right that energy will change when you change frames. The momentum will change when you change frames. But if you are in a fixed frame, then the energy is conserved and the momentum is conserved. If you define energy and momentum as they are defined in the relativistic case, not in the non-relativistic case, because if you define momentum like m times v, which is mass times velocity, then this particular thing is not conserved in a single frame. In special relativity, momentum is defined like m times v times the gamma factor. So if you define momentum like this, then this is conserved in a single frame. The next question comes from Thankpan. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. So the question is that why are Feynman diagrams considered revolutionary? I mean, how is pictorial representation of particle interaction a special thing? So the thing is that Feynman diagrams do make calculations easy. And there are alternatives to Feynman diagrams, actually. Uh, if you don't want to use Feynman diagrams, you can still do the calculation. There is something called the Wicks theorem that, you know, allows you to calculate whatever you want to calculate using Feynman diagrams. And the object that you want to calculate using Feynman diagrams are correlation functions. And correlation functions are nothing but the expectation value of a particular product of operators between two states. So you can calculate these correlation functions without using Feynman diagrams, using Wicks theorem. But the thing is that Feynman diagrams do give this, you know, nice intuitive picture in terms of particles coming in and interacting and then going out. The thing with Feynman diagram is that don't take it too literally because there are some scenarios where you don't have a particle interpretation because the fundamental thing in quantum field theory is it's not particle it's a field and you can have field configurations such that you cannot interpret those configurations in terms of particles or a finite number of particles so i would say that Feynman diagrams do provide this you know good interpretation but don't take them too literally. So the next question comes from I am Dipanjan. The question says, what topics specifically in mathematical methods should we focus on in undergrad if we want to pursue theoretical physics? I know all of it is important, but which topics require just a little special attention? So the answer to this question depends on what you want to do in your graduate level studies. If you want to do study particle physics or general relativity in your graduate level studies, then I would say that you need to understand differential geometry very well. If you want to work on general relativity, then of course, differential geometry is one of the key areas that you need to study. And if you want to be more specific, I would say that you need to understand Riemannian geometry very well. If you want to work on particle physics, then you also need to study algebraic topology for some areas and algebraic geometry for some areas. I'm assuming that you want to work in the line of string theory to some extent, but if you want to work on quantum gravity in general, even then differential geometry is very very important and 
In differential geometry, there is a topic that comes up all the time. The topic is fiber bundles. And fiber bundles are not just important for general relativity. They are also important because gauge theory can be written down as a fiber bundle and the things that appear in the context of fiber bundles. For example, the vector field in gauge theory that is denoted as A mu is called the connection on a fiber bundle, right? So if you understand fiber bundles, then A mu is nothing more than a connection on a fiber bundle. So if you understand fiber bundles, then the gauge theories become very, very intuitive in that particular language. In addition, I would also say that you need to study algebraic topology if you want to work on something like string theory or its related topics. And in algebraic topology, there are three big areas that you need to know. And those areas are homology theory or homology groups, homotopy groups, and the cohomology groups. So these three areas appear again and again in describing different areas of theoretical physics. So I would say that you need to learn differential geometry, algebraic geometry to some extent, not a lot, because it's a big area, algebraic geometry. And in differential geometry, I would recommend reading about fiber bundles. And lastly, algebraic topology. These areas appear again and again in a lot of you know different topics in theoretical physics. So the next question comes from Physics Lover. It says, is it possible to make a podcast with faculties, postdocs, and smart graduate students who are working on similar themes discussing who are working on similar themes discussing the general theme of resurgence and non renormalizable aspects of quantum field theory and if it can be res resolved by thinking about representation theory and infinite dimensional Lie group and its infinite dimensional Lie algebra okay I understood what your question is so the answer is that yes I am open to do podcasts with anyone right I mean there are a lot of people working on different areas and I would love to talk to them about the, those different areas one person that I want to do a podcast with who has done some work in research is Marcus Marino and Marcus Marino has this very very good book on instantons and the large and limit so I love that book first of all and I do want to do a podcast with him so let's see if I do a podcast with him in the future the next question comes from physics worldwide the question is that why world sorry, why light bends as it moves from one medium to another medium? So the answer to this question can be given at different levels. So I don't know what particular level you are expecting. If you stick to Huygens' interpretation of light, so Huygens gave this interpretation where he said that if you have a wave, then every point on the wave can be thought of as a source of secondary wavelets. And the new wave front that you will get is actually the envelope of these secondary wavelets, right? So if you take this particular interpretation of waves then you can of course uh, apply it to light as well if you have a single wavelet some part of this wavelet will be in the newer medium and the other part is in the older medium and we do know that light has different speeds in different media so because of this difference of speeds these wavelets kind of bend and this bending actually causes the refraction that we see so you can explain refraction or this bending of light just by using Huygens rule if you want to go at a deeper level then you can talk about light as an electromagnetic wave if you talk about electromagnetic waves, then it turns out that you have some boundary conditions when you have different media. So if you have two different media and you have a boundary between them, it turns out that there are some particular boundary conditions that electrical fields and magnetic fields need to satisfy. And the bending of light is nothing but a consequence of this particular boundary condition. So you can read chapter 9 of Griffiths. I can show you the derivation in the particular chapter that tells you that how to derive this bending of light just by using the boundary condition. So the next question comes from HXHDDDF. Um, okay, so the question is that for students interested in pursuing fundamental theoretical research in graduate school, what topics of research in particle physics and cosmology theory are most accessible to undergraduates? Please give suggestions on topics to investigate, especially without QFT or advanced GR. Second question, can string theory be learned and used as a tool after graduate school? or is it better to commit to it as early on as possible? So I would say that it's hard to do particle physics and cosmology without the knowledge of QFT and GR. You need to know the basics of QFT to do some meaningful work in particle physics, and you need to know GR to do some meaningful work in cosmology. But one thing that you can do is that if you're good at programming, then you can do some data analysis. There is heaps and heaps of data that comes out of particle accelerators and that comes out of you know, the investigations on gravitational physics, oh sorry, the gravitational waves physics actually. If you're good at programming, if you're good at data analysis, then you can contribute to analyzing that data. The second thing is that there are some inflationary models which are unexplored. 
if you have a particular inflationary model and you have an other inflationary model, the difference, the main difference in those models is the potential. And there are some basic calculations that need to be done for different potentials. So if you're good at those basic calculations, you can do those calculations and contribute in that particular way. The last thing that I want to say is about your second question. The second question was that, is it better to commit to string theory as early as possible or should you wait? So I would say that you can learn string theory whenever you want. There is no age limit on when you should try to uh, learn string theory. But one thing that I would want to say is that learn quantum field theory before learning string theory. Don't rush it because I've seen a lot of people who learn string theory without learning quantum field theory and that's not a good idea. So that's the only thing that I want to say about your second question. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing and the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will also like this video.